Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Ritchie. I'm from uh, the Boeing Company. I'm in Everett, Washington, and I'm primarily charged with enterprise training and looking at learning re science research across Boeing. I have a little bit of the research that I'd like to share today that's in our portfolio. We have five or six projects that are being funded currently, and I'm going to really uh, dive into one. Uh, so first, uh, on the agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about convergence and complexity and complex systems and how we're trying to instrument these systems from a learning perspective. I'm going to touch on the NAE grand challenges and one of the things that we're trying to focus on as far as solving, uh, trying to solve for the problem of advancing personalized learning. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about big, uh, the NSF and the big ideas there and some funding that we have underway with democratizing education and putting good uh, competency-based education online. And then I'll go and deep through uh, our Boeing case study, one case study, and show you how we're trying to deconstruct it. And then a little, like to finish a little bit with the uh, work on intelligent cognitive tutors, where we're headed with this, and some really excellent work that's going on, I think, at Intel and IBM and uh, others on the open AI initiative as far as trying to advance learning and instrument learning environments for both the social and the knowledge artifacts consumption. So I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, you may have seen this slide. I, I think I showed it at NSF a few uh, months ago, but it's really this uh, exponential growth of information. So in business, we have uh, all these issues really converging. We have this aging workforce, which is what we call this burning platform, this deep contextual knowledge that's actually moving out of the company. We have a labor market shift. We're actually trying to readjust some of the some of the job and skill codes based on cyber, cyber infrastructure, cyber data, cyber data, data, humans and machines in the loop, and uh, cobots, they call them, and trying to really understand the evolution of advanced manufacturing. Uh, so we have those pressures, the skill mismatch uh, that we're trying to uh, adjust for. Uh, and then also um, the higher education budget, we're trying to look at that, and we're doing some things in that space as far as providing uh, professional education and uh, education for undergraduates that's, uh, that's going to be built out of the NSF, uh, and then some disruptive learning technologies. I'll focus on that. But I think if you look at what IBM talks about as far as the build out of the Internet of Things and it leading to the doubling of, I don't know I would call it knowledge, but information, uh, it's the, the exponential rate that information is, uh, is um, is generated, and then the ability to comb through that information for contextualized application is a, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge for everyone, I think. So the NAE on advancing personalized learning, really like this. In the prior slide, you've seen this ex exponential rate of uh, information, uh, and then people require it to be contextual. They need it at a specific uh, period of time to close some co cognitive gaps. Everybody learns differently, and this is the kind of team that we're trying to put together here at Boeing right now. Uh, uh, statisticians and data scientists and learning scientists and structural designers. We've got people that are neuroscientists that we're bringing onto the team uh, and big data experts. And we're trying to get our ha a, a handle on this and try to understand it. Uh, just a, f a few months ago, in September or October, we went to the NSF and we said we would like to invest in building advanced manufacturing skills and capabilities at the national level. So we engineered a $10 million gift for the NSF uh, that uh, that went into a solicitation, that went out into a, uh, a dear colleague letter and into a solicitation. And from what I'm told by the program officers, it generated a lot of interest in the field on generating and instrumenting courses that are uh, targeting advanced skills and specifically under advanced manufacturing. Uh, they have three really big ideas that this idea fits under. It's uh, the future work at the human fr uh, technology frontiers, really how humans and machines work together, the cyber aspects, the physical, the trust, uh, the data, sensors on the machines, and then the data produced by the humans. How do you correlate and capture all that data? Uh, harnessing the data revolution falls right behind that. And then this notion of convergence, and really that's what attracted me to this, this, uh, this speaking engagement, this notion of casting these ideas into a different network and then bringing bring the convergent expertise that comes from a network like this. So uh, we, uh, uh, in this slide, you can see the link there. It's interesting, just a few weeks ago, Amazon, I'm not sure if Amazon is here, but they followed in, uh, in, our, in, in our path and created um, MOU and a $10 million gift to NSF just a few weeks ago. The announcement's right there at the bottom. Uh, and their 10 million was matched by NSF, and it's focused on biases 
and fairness and algorithms as something we're really concerned about too. So really good work that we can leverage and partner, uh, partner on there. Uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, our vice president just attended this not too long ago, and they see this change, this exponential change in machine learning and, and AI and its impact across market segment to jobs and to the future employability you know, is something that really needs to be addressed and focused on, and so uh, we're, trying to, um, we're trying to dive into that as far as uh, advanced manufacturing goes. And in this slide here, you see exactly what we're focused on, really in this uh, what jobs will define the next revolution. We're looking at model-based uh, engineering, where the, the physical representation of the part has a virtual manifestation, meaning a three-dimensional part imbued with all of its intelligence, its physics, its programming, its bill of material stuff, everything that you could put into that part and disseminate across a network of suppliers. Uh, also, the procedural uh, and contextual knowledge to make that part is also embedded in the part, so we're calling this uh, uh, model-based engineering or a digital twin. The, the physical and virtual manifestation of whatever you want to build, a car, a lawnmower, an airplane. So we're working on instantiating that environment, the virtual environment, with all of the intelligence that goes with building that uh, product. Uh, we're moving towards additive manufacturing, and I'll show you a little bit on a course that we built there. Uh, it's very disruptive, uh, disruptive to the supply chain, and we're uh, embedded with our production engineering folks on how to scale that in that environment. Uh, we're looking at cognitive uh, enhanced humans as far as bringing augmented reality and data sets and sensors and robots and work cells into the same place to, uh, and a data store, a data, uh, a data pond to store all of that information that we can look at as far as machine learning and algorithms to surface patterns that we just simply can't see. The data is just too rich and we're starting to make some headway there and then this notion of mixed uh, humans and machines. Uh, in the uh, World Economic Forum uh, document, uh, you can see these pressures are affecting everyone, from self-driving cars to the health industry to advanced manufacturing. All of these things are really starting to push the boundaries, especially in advanced manufacturing right now where we're setting. Uh, so some of the big things that we see emerging out of the technology space, and we're focused on some of those, of course, cybersecurity, uh, you know, uh, uh, augmented and virtual reality, so we can, so we can embed someone in a space and have them interact in that space with uh, AR, VR technology. Write down not just the uh, metacognitive and cognitive procedures that might go into uh, building a component, but also the f uh, physical through uh, augmented reality and some consumables that we're working around that as far as psychomotor stuff that we're working with, cloud computing. Uh, artificial intelligence that we're working on right now with trying to uh, interrogate these large instrumented data pools. And I'm going to give you an example of one that we're working on. One of the things I think is kind of interesting that's in the uh, World Economic Forum is this top 10 skills. I think, to me, if that, that's really, I think they're spot on. And I think it's an indicator. It, if you think of the T-shaped engineer, you've heard of that notion, right? Well, these are some of the skills in that T-shape. They still have to have deep you know, contextualized uh, 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 the physics behind whatever d domain they're setting in. But this complex solving, solving problem, critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence. I've been doing this for 30 years, and it's like emotional intelligence? OK. Well, in a social environment where you're collaborating and you're instrumenting that environment to optimize against some space, then you do have to have uh, uh, emotional intelligence. And so we're, we're trying to look at how we might uh, instrument that. So this is the case study that I talked about. Uh, Large-scale systems integration is core to Boeing, you know, putting together. There's 160,000 people, and we have contracts, you know, with 11,000 suppliers in 45 countries. So it's a very complex machine. And you, you think, well, why is Boeing in this learning space? Well, we teach 7 million hours a year. 60% of that is instructor-led, 40% is online. We have 11,000 courses in our portfolio. So we're like a small university. So any impact that we can have with the efficiency of building knowledge and then moving that across a, a network to scale, it makes a big difference. And so that's why we're in this space. Uh, this particular course, we partnered with MIT. It was a little bit different model because we brought people in from the fellowship to teach application. We leveraged faculty largely for the theoretical 
and the transfer from theoretical to application, so it's a, a co-created content. But it's very applicational. When, you, when you're through with this course, you come into Boeing and you apply what you learned on the course. There's no unlearning. So there's a nice, tight partnership between faculty and industry as far as theory to application. Uh, we offered this offline, uh, off hours, and then we pay for it. At Boeing, we have a Learning Together program that uh, funds $100 million in engineering training that's taken off hours, so we pay the university out of that pool. We built four courses, this architecture of complex system, and this particular certificate, this is at 8.5 CEUs, uh, so it's not credit, but CEUs, and I can, I can talk to you about the credential model here, and I can tell you where every student failed on every module and what, what they passed at every level, uh, and infinite detail, which you can't do with a, a typical letter grade. And I, I don't have a slide to share that, uh, with that today, but I can tell you we're going towards measuring it that, at that level of fidelity. So we have this architecture of complex systems. It's 20 hours, models and engineering, 20 model-based systems, 25, and this quantitative methods for systems engineering. They're staggered. They take three to five hours a week. You go through all four of these courses. You get a stamp from MIT saying that you're system certified, and we're actually using that inside uh, to generate paths for engineers that need to go to new airplane programs and other things like that. So I'm going to focus really on the architecture of complex systems. Uh, inside, it was really sold as online, you know, basic to intermediate uh, systems engineering knowledge, skills, and abilities. It looked at this alignment that I just now mentioned. It was scalable. So when we put this on this platform, we have over 4,000 people that have taken this course in, in the past year. And so it's, there's no other way to scale this. If I have butts and seats, I can get to 25 engineers, and I can teach you know, 50 weeks a year, and I'll get to a few thousand people. But this time, on this format, we got to 4,000 people in a little over a year. And we did it really good as far as cost efficiency. It's all online. These are some of the other courses that we're building. And I'm going to focus on this clickstream data part for the next few slides. So when we went into the learning environment, we said, here's the module, here's the learning objectives, here's the uh, content that supports that learning objectives, here's the assessment strategy. So we had some clear alignment across all three of those things. And to characterize that so that I knew when someone was clicking on something or hovering over something or took a pretest, and then I looked at the post-test, think of this as a knowledge object. And this might be the first module and the first course of architecture, architecture of complex system. Within that course, there are explicit documents, something that we can leave behind, state diagrams, things of that nature. There are math models that are explicit. There are videos. And the videos we break into three different genres. There's technical storytelling, the tutorials that you can go through. Then we have uh, immediate resources that can be explored outside of the context of the main learning objectives in this specific module. Then we have some pre and post that are right now up front, but I'd like to embed them in a pool of questions so that they're unobtrusive, and that's where we're moving next. And then we even have, uh, in our additive manufacturing, we have this on-shape software tool, which is a three-dimensional tool. You pull up, you make your, three, your, your additive manufacturing part, you post that part to an STL file. Your classmates actually look at the part and grade you on the learning objectives that are embedded in the software. So it's not just a a conceptual thing, you model something, and then the, the artifact is sent to a 3D printer, and it's graded by peer-generated uh, interaction. So really interesting pattern there. And then this space here is really the space that's kind of connected to this, this, uh, this, um, me this media event. We're really trying to understand. We can look at the learner and their interaction and proficiency. We've got good demographics on them. Uh, we've just introduced in this last course with MIT on leadership at the technical, technical leadership a uh, psychometric instrument. On, uh, we're using a short version of the Big Five, and I'll show you why here in a second. But just think of this as the learner or agent interacting with these different characterized resources that I can measure online, and then they drop down into a social space, and that's really what we're focused on next. What happens when they learn something, and what do they talk about at, in that place in the knowledge stream on the social media sites? So this is the course structure. Uh, I should have hit the clock here. This is the course structure. Uh, this is the first 20 hours that I just now talked about, architecture and complex systems. There's week one, and two, one two, three, four, five. What you're seeing there is the knowledge objects that are in that second level of the hierarchy. And below that are the specific assets that have been characterized so that the, we can see what the learner touches. And then underneath this is all of the CSV 
the JSON files, the NPL files, all of the chatter, all of the dust that's created from the interaction online. And then, uh, and then out of the first run we had, we, we, ran, uh, we, we set this up, uh, advertised it, had 1,600 Boeing engineers take it, uh, fifth, uh, 1,565 gener uh, uh, went on after the two week time period. And then uh, that, left us, uh, that left us with uh, roughly in that 20 hour module, 31 million click record events out of those 1,565 engineers. So a lot of data. Uh, we're looking at, and we're integrating this right now, this uh, critical chain theory stuff where you can look at an individual, say I have a systems engineer that uh, has two years experience and they're interacting with the content. I, if you leave it to the, if you leave it open, you can see every single agent learner interacts with the content in a different way. They don't go through it in this static, logical 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. You see them branching out and looking at things that they're interested in as far as the topics and the modules. And so we're using this state transition model to look at, gather the background demographics on the individual themselves and something about their personas so that we can cluster these because we can see personas emerging out of the social interactions and behavior. And then use these state uh, uh, diagrams to look at who they touch in the network and the networks that form after and the resources that are consumed. So there's some really good work out there uh, on, the state, uh, on the state transition model. So what does this look like? So out of those 1,565 engineers, uh, uh, we filter these into kind of very crude interaction behaviors. So there were some people that went to the test first and then came back. There were some people that went methodically through the content. There were some people that uh, adjusted their style midstream. So on, on the, uh, the uh, y-axis here, uh, that's the number of students and the x-axis is time. And you can see these four kind of elbows that came out of the uh, clustering. This is what uh, made us really decide to put some psychometric instruments behind us and then compare that with the interaction patterns and the data that was produced uh, by the uh, demographics and then the trajectory of the student uh, consuming this stuff. So what you're seeing here, and this is kind of interesting, and I think this is one of the first things out there I've seen that actually shows what a student path looks like. So in the green, you can see uh, they're moving forward. The magenta is moving backwards. You can see some of these big spots here are content knowledge, social activities, group problems, uh, uh, pre-testing strategies. And each one of these loops are the knowledge that's built in that hierarchy. And this one, these two happen to be around defining and illustrating the boundaries. Uh, this one is around constructing the DSM. This one's around defining the deliverables with the architect, and you can see these are the knowledge loops, and you can see where they move. So this is pretty, a pretty efficient student. 99%, they spent 16.3 hours in a 20-hour class. Uh, this is what it looks like as far as this, this notion of interweaving. And we all do this. You know, everybody goes a little bit ahead. They, they think they know something. They get on a social network. They talk about it a little bit. They back up a little bit to see it. Uh, and, and then they, they, they go through this metacognitive process. And I'll show you what this looks like. Uh, in detail on one of the students, which I think is quite fascinating. This is uh, kind of this is kind of like me, randomly all over the place. Can't really, you know, no good metacognitive strategy. Didn't do so well. 14 hours in a 20-hour course, 71 percent passing. So, what's the big deal here? If we can train a machine learning algorithm to recognize patterns and look at knowledge gaps along each one of these loop dimensions, which are really knowledge and assessment combined, then we can start to guide this student from a, a very random metacognitive engagement with the, whatever the content is to this. And we can do this uh, with intelligent tutors. And that's my last slide, and I'll show you how we're trying to do that. So I think this is pretty interesting as far as uh, leveraging this for um, machine learning patterns. This is another example of this, but this is just video. So on the video itself, now this is interesting. We publish uh, a, a, a 10 hour course on introduction to composite overview for engineers, put it online on edX on a Wednesday. On a Friday, it had 12,000 people. <laughs> what was most interesting about the 12,000 people that signed up, it's probably 2,000 PhDs, maybe 6,000 bachelors science kids, and then there's like 485 school teachers that pulled down the content from this site to bring it into their classroom to tell their kids about why Boeing's building a carbon fiber reinforced airplane. 
And I thought that's pretty cool, uh, pretty cool use of this. But what, what you can see here is more of this inter, interweaving. This is the uh, student ID. Uh, this is November, December, January. These are the short, very short topical uh, lectures. And these lectures, like I said before, they're, they're really tacit knowledge. This is someone describing what it is. Uh, some professor or some subject matter expert. And then what we can see here, you can look just, because this was a MOOC and it was for, offered for everybody, you can see some gaps in this, which are normal. But you could see this person here, how they go through. And look at this interweaving, where they jump. They go back to this, uh, what is this? Typical, uh, 1.7, typical composite fiber construction. You see them, keep, they keep going back. And then they touch this blue one this blue one right here, scope of composites, and then they keep going back. This is just interweaving, and you can see it as a reflection of their engagement and where they go forward and backwards across the space. And so what, why does that matter? Uh, we can start looking at the chatter and the social network. We can look at the knowledge object. We can look at the assessment strategy, and we can look at where the chatter in that network is driving complexity. If, there, if, the, cognition, if the cognitive load is perceived, and it's indexed really high on the social network, we can correlate it back to was there some missing component in the, in the uh, construct of the uh, uh, knowledge objects that we put together. And then uh, this is the student, one of the students I talked about a little earlier. Uh, they spent 120 hours in the 20-hour course. Uh, they generated over 100,000 clicks. This person is a perfectionist. But what's interesting is this metacognitive strategy. I can actually look at all of these. This is the start of the course. Uh, these are all the objects, the videos, the assessments, the, the explicit artifacts that are in this course. And I can look at where they went back and forth and back and forth around a certain concept. So I think that's kind of interesting. We're trying to uh, parse this out right now. And here's how we're trying to do it. If I can hit this next one. So working with UTA, uh, George Siemens, and we're trying to really, really instrument the environment so that we can differentiate the, the uh, using some work from Sweller on cognitive load, uh, cognitive load, uh, and trying to understand: is it easy, de declarative? Is it uh, uh, more procedural and more complex? You know, the, the topic itself, or is it conditionalized? Does it really only? Can you really only figure this out when you get to this place in the in the knowledge stream? And so we're trying to. Uh, uh, instrument the clicks and picks so that we can see cognitive load that's based on Sweller's work. We're also trying to look at uh, instrumenting this and, and seeing when they're on the social network, uh, the social dimensions of this uh, data, the cognitive dimensions of this data, and even the metacognitive strategies that exist and the engagement patterns from the students. Um, one of the things going back to networks is what we're seeing in our network is you can see these like ties, like the didactic ties, they have a lower performance and engagement and flow of knowledge. They consume less, they produce less, they share less. But with these simulian kind of ties where there's influence that's generated from expertise, knowledge that's posted on the, on, on the site and the social media site, we see that, that that's consumed by more of the students. We see the uh, value of that individual surface because of the centrality and weight of the nodes. And this is kind of what you're seeing here. And so we're trying to, uh, Sandy Pentland's work out of MIT, he does some stuff on individual versus collective knowledge. And so we're trying to understand an instrument at that level as well. And so I won't get into that. I got just a few more minutes. Last year, we used Google, uh, BigQuery. And you can see right here the systems engineering course that I talked about. And so in there, we can write our own code. We've posted a bunch of this on GitHub. We can also pull out a canned set of uh, algorithms that we can run against these data sets. And that's really how we got some of the stuff that I just now showed you. And then uh, last couple of slides. As if you think about this notion of cognitive intelligent tutors, this is some uh, work from Bruce Horn from Intel. Uh, he shared this at the IBM OpenAI uh, meeting, and we've published some stuff on this uh, I can share with you. But some really interesting work on trying to look at this and instrument this uh, fully and holistically. And so you have to take all of these dimensions into uh, place. You have to figure out how to instrument them, how to make data dictionaries to support the clicks and picks and the intentions that's behind this. You got to write al algorithms that are behind this to help surface the interaction and the patterns of students. And then uh, Lastly, uh, this is out of the World Economic Forum uh, uh, report, and I think it's kind of spot on, and we're actually trying to engage in all of these things right now. So we're looking at uh, large-scale machine uh, learning, 
deep learning, reinforcement learning. We're looking at humans and, uh, and robots in the loop and how to instrument both the sensors and the individual agents in that, in that space. Uh, data pools, data structures, data dictionaries to kind of surface intention and, and interaction both at the agent level and at the collective level. Uh, we're using natural language processing on the, all of the chatter. It's a really weak space that we're in right now. Uh, edX discussion board, we're using the edX platform right now to instrument and look at this stuff, but that platform is really weak on the social aspect. This year we incorporated Yellowdig, if you know Yellowdig. And so we're instrumenting and trying to understand and correlate through the atomic timestamps of the individual, what they consume and what they say when they consume it. And then uh, we haven't got to this yet, but we think that this could be really big as far as uh, photonics and the ability to scale a lot of assets to uh, fish and this big data pool that we're generating. And I think that's it.